So without further ado, uh, Professor Richard Deeth. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks to everybody here for uh, attending what is no doubt going to be the most challenging lecture that you hear at Dan in terms of the fact that it's all about molecules. It's all about the details and small stuff. But the small stuff is what leads to the big outcomes. And so we need to have both the big picture and the small picture. And that's what I'm going to try to familiarize you with today is really the molecular uh, origins of what I think contributes to autism, um, but it also tells us a lot about how the brain is working in regard to, let's say, other conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, chronic fatigue syndrome, ADHD, and so forth. And the important players here listed in my title, oxidative stress, methylation, transsulfuration, the process by which we turn homocysteine into uh, cysteine, and then in the brain in particular, and the big point here is that all tissues are not the same. The brain has evolved special metabolism that makes it especially vulnerable to oxidative problems. So with the way I break it down here, we'll talk about sulfur metabolism, and I'll, I'll approach it from the standpoint of evolution. And this is going way back, but hopefully this will be helpful to understand how we got where we are now. And uh, then we'll talk about oxidative stress on that sulfur metabolism, the enzyme methionine synthase in autism in particular, the B12, methyl B12, the cofactor for that enzyme. And then we'll talk about the D4 dopamine receptor, how it is that those events lead to neurotransmission and neural synchronization problems that uh, affect kids with autism. So. Where to get started? Well, if you're going to get started talking about these issues, how far back can we go? Let's go back to the beginning of life. Join me. Give me a little leeway here. If you turn in the Discovery Channel, for example, on cable, uh, you might see some shows about uh, life, the origins of life. And if you do, the people that uh, are thinking about the origins of life think that it began under the water, the bottom of the ocean, where volcanic vents allowed gases to come out of volcanoes. And the gases uh, included hydrogen sulfide here, which is a, a reduced form of sulfur, uh, but also other gases that uh, include methane, ammonia, carbon dioxide. But importantly, at the beginning of life, under the water, there was no free oxygen, no molecular oxygen. Sure, there was oxygen in the form of water, but that's reduced oxygen. It's not O2. It's not the air that we breathe. So the first life was anaerobic. Anaerobic, it didn't use oxygen. That came later. Anaerobic life began somewhere down this three billion year journey. But evolution can be importantly linked to oxidative metabolism because as oxygen became more prevalent in the atmosphere, it became a threat because oxygen oxidizes. And even as we sit breathing in, breathing out, we're risking oxidation. And as we age, we're showing oxidation. So oxidation is a part of life and avoiding oxidative damage is a part of life. And uh, we are over here. We're sandwiched in on the right end, humans, two and a half million years ago. Uh, it seems like a long time, but in the scheme of things, it's really uh, not so long um, in, the, in the bigger picture. So in any case, if we had these gases down there, these gases conveniently form the sulfur-containing thiol compound cysteine. We've talked about it a lot. Here it is in the chemistry of cysteine. This is the business place, the sulfur with a hydrogen attached to it. Now, if cysteine is made and available, let's say, for example, uh, hypothetically from these uh, gases down there, you can take two of those cysteines, attach them to each other as the oxidized cysteine disulfide here in a reversible manner, and presto, you have a redox buffer. 
That is to say, when you put two thiols together, just like that, if the system is, gonna, is going to require some reducing equivalents over here, the hydrogens, they're available. But on the other hand, if the system needs something to move to the left, this is reversible, and that can happen also. So what you have when you have two thiols in this form is the basic kind of redox buffering system. If oxygen comes along, no problem. You got two hydrogens, you can turn it into water. So this is a, a primitive redox buffer. Now even before oxygen was around in early life, the redox buffering of compounds and molecules was important. What is redox? It's the loss or gain of electrons in, in reactions. It could be oxygen. Oxygen is just one example of something that loses or gains electrons. So redox is a big thought, a primitive thought about life, and we need to be able to control redox because life needs to exist in like a narrow range of, of redox possibilities. It can't be all one way or all the other side of this reaction here. So as evolution proceeds and oxygen becomes available, uh, it's a danger to certain organisms. The more oxygen, the more dangerous. But if uh, certain genetic uh, uh, mutations or exploration of new gene structures it takes place, maybe those new organisms with these mutations can learn new tricks. If they learn new tricks that make them resistant to oxygen damage, or let's say they have antioxidant abilities, they'll survive that oxygen better. If they do, they'll not only survive, but they'll multiply, like Dr. Spock says, or something like that. And uh, as it turns out, the tricks for surviving oxygen and for adapting to oxidative stress and stuff like that involve sulfur metabolism. Sulfur is our primary antioxidant. And I'm not making this story up. I'm just borrowing it from other people who have uh, proposed, this is a science article in Science Magazine about two years ago now, that the origin of the Earth, origin of life, proceeded through intermediate steps, ultimately resulting in the complexity of the genome, that is the complexity of our makeup, and that it was driven by metabolic adaptations to an oxygen environment. That is to say, as we accumulate more adaptations, we have more complexity. And I suppose we are at the top of this chain. I could say that humans are at the top of this evolutionary pathway. And I could say that human brain is at the very top of the tissue types that are evolving.